Good evening. This evening is Wednesday, May the 12th, 1999, at the Agroth Israel Synagogue. We are ha having an evening to talk about Moses Bilski, A Life Well Lived, delivered by Anna Bilski and Millie Mursky. This is Lawrence Friedman. I'm going to record my comments about the late Ben Carp, past president of the, of the Ottawa Jewish Historical Society. I will be the first speaker. Family, late Ben Carp, whose name is, is attached to the Ben Carp Memorial Lecture. Ben's parents came from Russia. Mother was Dora, father was Max. They were known as Kapinski. They moved to England, Montreal, and then Ottawa. Ben was born in Ottawa on May the 20th, 1918. His brothers were Nathan. He had seven brothers. There were eight boys. Nathan, Charlie, Knapp, who's going to be 89 this year, Harry, Howard, late Ben, Alan, and Maury. Three are alive today, Knapp, Alan, and Maury. Ben was a newsboy on front of the Shadow Lorry, I guess, where Rideau ends and Wellington begins. Those who were from Ottawa way back, that's where the, the uh, stairs went down to catch the Hull uh, streetcar or the trains went across the interprovincial bridge. There used to be a stairs beside the Shadow Lorry. Am I right, Edda? Thank you. He attended uh, your, uh, York Street Public graduated from Commerce. He married his childhood sweetheart, Etta Schulman. He enlisted in the Canadian Army and served in the Algonquin Regiment. He fought in the front line in Holland and rose to Sergeant Major. Ben was a leader. He and Etta returned to Holland after the war to visit people who he had liberated. After the war, he had a grocery store at the corner of Booth and Albert, thank you, associated in the food industry and real estate, and was with Bert Katz along with other real estate industry people such as Sam Macy, Campbell Corporation, and Lowe's. He was president of the Ottawa Jewish Historical Society on August the 27th, 1986, and served till his death on December the 6th, 1991. He developed and expanded the Popular Speakers Program. He publicized the History, Historical Society, and Archives, and wherever he went, he spoke up on both the Archives and the Historical Society. Ben was a super salesman, and in that manner, he brought many more members into the association. He was very proud of the society. Ben was president of Acadian Realty. He was president of the Ottawa Real Estate Board. He was president of Rito Kiwanis. He was regional lieutenant governor of Kiwanis. One week prior to his death, Kiwanis International awarded him their highest honor, Outstanding Service Award. At that time, only four in the world had received it until he received his. He had a perfect attendance at Rito Kiwanis for 36 continuous years. He was very active in the Jewish community. He was active in the Jewish Community Center. He helped establish, and they established the Ben Karp Award, the JCC, Jewish Community Center, for, uh, for members of the Ottawa Jewish community, community who worked for the, in the JCC for outstanding achievement in the JCC. It's, called the Ben Carp Award. He set, helped set up the JCC Health Club and athletic activities. He was president of a good Israel synagogue. He was active in Ottawa Lodge B'nai B'rith starting in 1949. He was active in the Ottawa Boys Club. Ben was very active in the Canadian Cancer Society. For 15 years due to his having cancer, he gave positive strength to others who had cancer and uh, seeked him for their advice, for his advice. On May the 20, May the 30th, 92, when I took over president, I knew Ben. 
Ben was happy. He was vibrant. He loved of life. He was positive. Positive outlook to everyone. Dave Brown in the Ottawa Citizen, approximately one week after his death, in Brown's column, which you still read today, quote, this is his words on Ben Carp, spent much of his life helping others. Another quote, cornerstone of the Ottawa Jewish community serving on many boards. Another quote, he was a happy, vibrant, peppery man with a quick laugh and an attitude enjoy life and make the best of every day. I was associated with Ben for a number of years and I was very much the wiser due to his knowledge and experience in the commercial field in real estate. Few words can summarize the man, I don't think I can, but he was a very honest man. He was a dedicated human being. Maybe if he wouldn't have been honest as so, he would have been more wealthier. But he was wealthy in his friends, he was wealthy in his communal work. Ben and Etta have three sons, 10 grandchildren. Barry has two children, Ricky has two children, and Lenny, Lenny who is very religious, has six children. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Ben Carp, our past president, spent a lot more time. I want to thank his wife, she's here this evening, and as a very little small token of our appreciation, I want to give her a gift of some photographs that were taken October 17, 97, last fall. done my talking and it took longer than I anticipated. Um, <coughs> I now will call upon Betsy Regal to introduce our guest speakers. Now we play hopscotch. <laughs> Good evening. I'm delighted to introduce Mildred and Anna, two very accomplished and dedicated women who will talk tonight about our remarkable great-grandfather, Moses Bilski. First, however, I would like to mention their parents, the much-loved Lawrence and Esther Bilski. After the death of their mother, Lawrence and his brother Sylvan went to live with their aunt and uncle, Lillian and A.J. Freeman. My mother, Dorothy, often reminisced lovingly about the little boys who came to stay. One of my first recollections of Lawrence and Esther was their wedding, which was held on Somerset Street in my grandparents' home. Esther, the daughter of Cantor and Mrs. Rabin, was indeed a beautiful bride, and Lawrence, a very handsome young woman. And I, aged eight, caught the bouquet. Mildred and Anna grew up in a warm and caring and busy household. Lawrence was a kind and thoughtful gentleman, always the gentleman in a jacket and tie, with a quiet sense of humor. Esther was efficient and vivacious. Both parents were working, and at the same time, Esther was involved with many philanthropic and charitable works, an activity she continued until late in life. Mildred graduated with a degree in nursing and subsequently taught psychiatric nursing for several years. She returned to university in 1988 to complete a master's degree in education for which she was awarded a Governor General's Gold Medal for Academic Excellence. She recently retired from Health Canada to become the bride of Stephen Mursky, <laughs> and now devotes herself to home, garden, and of course, her husband. Anna obtained, in this order, a master's degree in micro micro microbial, genetic. Micro microbial genetics, married Peter, and worked in the public service for six years before retiring to be at home with her two children, Lawrence and Sharon. Presently, she edits for the National Research Council on a freelance basis, following seven years as a science editor with the council. Anna, like her mother, is the consummate volunteer. With a La Lèche League, the Childbirth Education Association, the Parent Resource Center, and Citizen Advocacy, where she's on the board. 
Mildred and Anna have indeed lived up to their heritage. They have done a great deal of research on this evening's topic, the fascinating life of Moses Bilski. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce them. To retrieve information about Ottawa's first Jewish settler requires a bit of digging. We would like to begin by thanking those who helped us in our search. Don Logan of the Ottawa Jewish Archives, who was unparalleled in her enthusiasm for Moses and the early days of the Ottawa Jewish community. Don's assistant, Marcia Mordfield, Donna Gutman of the Jewish Community Centre Library, and Cheryl Jaffe of the National Library of Canada. Gary Fox kindly brought some Bilski watches for you to see, and he prepared the transparencies for us. Gary collects and repairs antique pocket watches that have a connection to Bytown and Ottawa. The first pocket watch in his collection is from M. Bilski and Son. I must thank Moses for having the foresight to bring Reverend Mursky to this city, and it only took <laughs> over 100 years for our family to be families to be joined. Lastly, Anna and I encourage you, if you have not already done so, to look at the Bilski memorabilia we have on display. Anna's first. <laughs> As usual. No, it's not usual. <laughs> I have to find my place now. I'm going to start and tell you about Moses' Moses's early years. Um, he was quite a guy, our great-grandfather. Um, he was uh, what was called the original wandering Jew. It's kind of appropriate. He was actually born in Kovna, Lithuania in 1829. His mother died in, um, there are different stories about how she died, but probably in a pogrom or some hideous thing. And uh, his father, whose name was Eli, spelled with a Y, brought Moses and his little sister, Carrie, <laughs> I, I find that a wonderful name, Carrie, who's, uh, the Yiddish, I think, is Tzeta, but uh, I don't know where the Carrie came from. And uh, they originally arrived in New York. He didn't like it New York, so he decided to go north and went to Kempville. It's kind of a switch, right? <laughs> so he, he went to Kempville. Moses was 14 years old. Tzeta was probably four, so I think that's kind of remarkable. The... Uh, Closest metropolis, of course, was Bytown, which we now know is Ottawa. Apparently, Moses came here to Bytown quite often on business and for pleasure. When he was about 28, his father decided to go to Palestine for his declining years, which apparently was quite a common thing to do at that time. After, Moses, after that, Moses stayed in with relatives in New York for a little while, but he just was a little too adventurous, so he decided to strike out on his own. He came back to Ottawa in 1857, and most of the time, most of his life since then, obviously, he spent here. By that time, by the way, Bytown was Ottawa. In 1860, Moses witnessed, it's, I think it's fabulous, he witnessed the laying of the cornerstone of the Parliament buildings by the Prince of Wales, who <coughs> later became King Edward VII. It's kind of kind of a nifty connection to me. Um, the following year, so the eight, 1861, I think we're up here, we have it on the slide here, um, Moses decided he was just, he couldn't stay away from the caribou gold fields in British Columbia. That was uh, an incredible pull. He booked his passage on a ship called the North Star that left New York, went to Aspinwall, went across the Isthmus, Is mess of Panama, we're all having trouble with things today, uh, and went to Panama and then went, sailed from Panama up the west coast, I shouldn't use my hand, should I, <laughs> up the west coast to Victoria because Vancouver didn't exist then. There's another theory that says that actually he didn't go that way, he actually went down around Cape Horn, but we'll stick with Panama for now. He uh, went up the Fraser River to the Caribou and he stayed one winter at the Williams Creek Mine. That's when he found out what an awful life mining was. I mean, you can imagine, 1861. All manner of the lowest of humanity was out there trying to get rich quick. 
He found himself broke, which was really easy to do. The price of ordinary commodities was very dear. For example, onions and potatoes sold for a dollar a piece. And I think the dollar was worth more then than it is now. <laughs> he then decided to go to work for a more successful miner who paid him an ounce a day. He saved up his ounces and he went into business for himself, bringing provisions to the other miners. Some sources have Moses in the wholesale grocery business, and we think maybe they're referring to this time when he was providing provisions to the other miners. Another miner, by the way, tried Moses' abandoned claim, and he got $14,000 out of it. <laughs> so, what can we do, eh? So Moses decided it was time to go back east and return to a quieter life. Sounds reasonable. With some companions, he headed off on horseback to San Francisco, about 1,500 treacherous miles away. He didn't stay there very long either. He was immediately recruited to go prospecting, to do some prospecting in Central America. Back in Panama again, he discovered that he had been hoodwinked. He'd been hired to participate in illegal gun running to Mexico in an attempt to overthrow the Emperor Maximilian, who was then on the throne in Mexico. Moses, as they say, was sickened to his very soul, and he frantically sought means of escape. At last, in a shop, he found a man of his own race, obviously a Jewish man, who offered to smuggle him away. He disguised, he emerged disguised as a dock laborer, and he stowed away on the very ship he was helping to load. Back in San Francisco, the Civil War between the North and the South was in progress. Moses enlisted in Uncle Sam's army in a German regiment known as Abraham Lincoln's Guard under Captain Myers. Following the assassination of President Lincoln in 1865, riots broke out and martial law was declared. Moses protected the citizens somewhat better than himself, for in a sharp encounter with rioters, he was wounded in the leg. Apparently, he was very proud of this wound, and he loved to tell stories about it. I think he got a lot of mileage out of that wound. Soon the Civil War was over, and so were Moses' fighting days. He returned to Ottawa in 1867, and he opened his first store, which was a jewelry store called Pawn Shop. That was 1867. This is how we got our exercise. This is Pauline. This is Pauline. This is our great grandmother. Moses and Pauline Reach met in 1874 in New York. Moses was, in, to quote a, an author, a great strapping, rough tongued man of 45. He was over six feet tall and he had a magnificent physique. <laughs> but wonderful hair. Pauline was only 17 and barely five feet tall. It was love at first sight. That's what everybody says. That is one fact that has come down, absolutely. They were married later that year in Brooklyn, but there's a story here. Pauline's father is a wealthy Brooklyn businessman. He wanted to know who this Bilski was and what did he have to offer. So Moses invited Pauline's parents to see what he owned. In truth, he owned very little. But he had lots of friends, and one of them owned a lumber mill and lots of land. So he agreed to a con job. Pauline's parents came up north, and everyone said, oh, yes, Bilski owns this, and Bilski owns that, and this is Bilski's, and this is Bilski's. And so they got married. Had he known how poor he was, uh, the marriage would never have taken place. After the marriage, Pauline was a little surprised to learn the truth, too. <laughs> but many years later, our grandfather told our mother that she had said to him that she had never wanted for anything in her life. I thought that was quite wonderful. Pauline, despite her small stature, wielded considerable power when she said, Bilski, he just did what she wanted. <laughs> and the person who told me that, Betsy, was her mother. 
Moses and Pauline spent time in Montreal, then they went to Mattawa, and then they came back to Ottawa. By 1890, Moses was quite a prosperous man. His jewelry store and banking business had become an asset in the growing city of Ottawa. He'd made the name Bilski synonymous with jewelry in Ottawa and became one of the largest jewelry retailers in Eastern Canada. We have a transparency. It's okay, no. <laughs> Pocket watch. Yeah. Gary tells us that this pocket watch from Bilski Jewelers is an example of the fine quality watches that Moses Bilski sold. And here we have a picture of the shop. And there's another picture at the back. There's another picture at the back too. This is Rideau Street around 1898. Please note the pocket watch and spectacles, which are outside the shop, are then Bill Steen and Son. It's a little, it's not as neat as the next one. But if you see the picture at the back, you can, see it, you can see it more, yeah, you can see it more clearly at the back too. The pocket watch and spectacles. Um, we also have on display at the back, which a lot of you have seen, a bill of sale from this shop in 1906, which acknowledges a payment of $13 from John Dover towards his account. <laughs> Moses' shop moved several times, but he was always on Rideau Street, and he was always close to the railway station. The name of his shop also changed. Sometimes it was Moses Bilski, sometimes it was M. Bilski and Son, and sometimes it was Bilski Limited. At the end of the 1880s and through the 1890s, it became apparent that electricity was becoming much more common and uh, streetcars were still run, drawn by horses, but this was clearly changing. Thomas Ahern and Warren Soper had provided electricity to the city a few years earlier, and they'd obtained the franchise for an electric street railway company and subsequently formed the Ottawa Electric Railway Company. Thomas Ahern went to Moses Bilski and said, come and invest in the Electric Railway Company. And Moses Bilski said, quote, Ahern, you're crazy. You'll never get a streetcar to run without a horse and cart." <laughs> oh, Grandpa. <laughs> no. <laughs> But he made better choices in his other <laughs> There's a family tree. I'll give you a little bit about the family. Moses, Moses and Pauline had 11 children, five boys and six girls. There was a 12th child named Harry, and he died in infancy for birth. I guess he died at birth, actually. The oldest child... It starts at this end, obviously. The oldest child was Sam. and Alex. Alex, I'm sorry. Alex was the oldest child. I can't read. Where, where did I put my glasses? Alex was the oldest child. And I was always told, I remember when I was young, that he was very vain when he was a young man. And because he had beautiful hands, he slept with gloves on. So that his hands would always stay in his. He had one daughter, Evelyn Feldman. Sam never married. He's the son in M. Bilski and Son. And he worked in the store. He was an avid sports fan and a sports promoter, and he was the bell ringer at the boxing matches. He was also generous, true. I mean, it's a who can make that up, you know? He, <laughs> he was also generous to a fault. <clears throat> Apparently, somebody saw somebody on the street one day, and he literally gave the shirt off his back. And I can certainly believe it. Tilly was the first girl. And she contracted polio as a child, and she was confined to a wheelchair all her life. Um, because of Tilly, <clears throat> excuse me, a woman by the name of Julia was hired to come and be a caregiver for Tilly. And in the family album at the back, you'll see pictures of Julia. And oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right. I'll go back to Tilly. 
who's at the back? Wave at me if you can hear. <laughs> um, um, stand over here. Is that better? That's better. Okay. Sorry. I'll go back. No. Um, <laughs> Julia was hired as a caregiver for Tilly. And we remember Julia because she lived with our grandfather. And on Sunday afternoon, Julia would give us ginger ale and white cake. I've never liked ginger ale and white cake. Julia was actually a ward of the family. I guess she would have been called slow, and the family looked after her until she died. I remember, I think it was our mother who put her in a nursing home when she was in her 90s. Jack, the next, next one is Jack. Jack married Marion, and he lived in Ottawa and had one son who lives in Kentucky. Our father was not fond of Aunt Marion. And he loved to tell the story of how Aunt Marion got stuck on a toilet seat and had to be rescued by the fire department. <laughs> that, was, that was one of his favorite stories. <laughs> My gentle father. <laughs> Lillian, fifth child, and the best known and probably the best known and best loved of all the children. She carried on the tradition of helping just like her parents, and she did this until she died. And Millie's going to talk more about how her parents, how they did all this helping, helping stuff. She married A.J. Freeman. They had two, they had three children, and they had twin girls who died in infancy. She was an active Zionist, and she was the founder of Hadassah Canada. She brought Hadassah into Canada. She organized a number of Palestinian emergency relief funds, Palestine emergency relief funds, there were just an enormous number of good works that Lillian did. Her life will be dealt with in a future lecture. Nathan, number six, is our grandfather, and he married Mildred Markson. She, I believe, was a friend of Etta's, his sister Etta, and uh, he had a business in Chatham, Ontario. He was widowed at an early age, and his sons, our father and our uncle, went to live with Aunt Lil. Grandpa quit school in grade nine. Uh, apparently, he was asked to uh, write something out longhand or do some assignment, and he just said, no. And he quit school and worked on the railroad. Oh. Etta. Etta was considered the beauty of the family. Um, she married Abraham Schrag, and they lived in northern Ontario. Uh, they had at least two sons. Wilma can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Moses Bilsky Schrag, um, I forget whether he was the older or the younger. Anyway, he changed his name and, to Mark Byrne, and our father was greatly offended. He thought that was a terrible thing to do. Rebecca married Abe, Abe Jacobs, lived in Montreal and had two daughters, and Wilma's here with us tonight, which is quite wonderful. Lucy. Married Alan Bronfman of Winnipeg. They lived in Montreal. He was a lawyer, industrialist, and community activist. They had three children, Mona, Peter, and Edward. Peter married Diane Feldman, who was a granddaughter of Alex. Lucy's son married her grandniece, and Edward is the only one who's alive today. Eva, the youngest girl, wrote children's stories, and we have two of them at the back. Uh, she illustrated one of them. She also had a column in the newspaper for Sunshine or Handicapped Children. There's a picture of the Sunshine, sunshine Children in the, in the album also. She suffered from depression, and she died in Ottawa at the age of 54. And the youngest child was David. And David was, he married and had two children and lived in New York. And he died of a heart attack at the age of 51. And now it's Millie's turn. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Ottawa, the early years. Ottawa's reputation in the mid-19th century was that of a tough, brawling municipality, not uncommon to an important lumber centre, which was its chief claim to fame. Religious animosity existed between Roman Catholics and Protestants, and there was racial hatred between the French and English. Sounds unfamiliar, doesn't it? It is understandable why many people, Jews included, avoided permanent residence here. In addition, Ottawa, although only 125 miles from Montreal, 
and Canada's largest Jewish community, was a difficult place to reach in that the most convenient means of travel up the Ottawa River was a slow process. One reason why people came to Ottawa was that peddling was much cheaper here. The hawking license in Ottawa cost 10 cents annually versus $25 in Montreal. The Bilski home on Nicholas, was on Nicholas Street, just south of Laurier, and at a later date, they moved to Daly Avenue. The house on Nicholas Street was large. It had to be. There were, as you know, 11 Bilski children. When Moses' sister died, her four young daughters came to live with them. At this time, Jewish immigrants began to arrive in Canada, seeking refuge from persecution in Europe. There were no benevolent societies in those days, so these people, actually whole families, moved in with the Bilskis. The Bilski children never knew who would be sleeping in their beds or wearing their clothes. Moses set these people up in business, in small stalls in the market, and helped them to adjust to the ways of a new country. He would get up at 4 a.m. to supervise their activities. Pauline got up at 5 a.m. and supervised the laundry, mending, and feeding of all these people. Before the Sabbath, or a Jewish holiday, Moses would go to the jails to see if any Jews were there. He would bring them home and then return them when the holidays or Sabbath were over. <laughs> As you can imagine, some of these immigrants got themselves into difficulty. Reverend Mursky recounts the following. One morning in the early part of summer, I took a stroll to Parliament Hill. As I approached the grounds, I saw lying face down on the dewy grass a tall man. When I came nearer, I was startled to find that the man was Moshe Bilski. I asked him in surprise and fear what had happened. He answered, imagine a Jew is in jail. He was taken in last night because of a license. I woke up the mayor in the middle of the night I rapped with my cane on his door with all the anger the thing calls for, and he told me that he needed an order from the Minister of Justice to release the prisoner. I'm waiting here for the Minister of Justice, who has not arrived yet. <laughs> that same day, the Jewish peddler was released. <coughs> now, Anna, Mo uh, you did it. Moses and the Ottawa Jewish community. The Bilski home was also a house of prayer with Moses conducting most of the services himself. Services were also held at the homes of other leading figures of the day or in other modest or humble surroundings. To get a minion or quorum for the holidays, letters were sent to Jewish people living within a radius of 30 miles of the city. In an interview with Rabbi Lifshitz, Jacob Friedman, Lawrence's grandfather, spoke in a, shall we say, somewhat unflattering way about Moses. Despite this, Mr. Friedman left his money with Moses for safekeeping. Mr. Friedman mentioned that there were two competing minyanim and that factional groups developed in the religious life of the community, which I know you'll find very hard to understand. <laughs> According to Jacob Friedman, Moses was unhappy with the organized minion of which, of which he was not the leader and started an independent minion in his own home with Zachar Dov Berman, Martin Levinson's grandfather, as leader. Both groups eventually made peace. Moses was one of the founders of the first Jewish congregation at Eth Jeshurun and was its president from 1900 to 1902. And Eth Jeshurun was formally founded, actually, like it really in 1892. Its history goes back two years before that, when John Dover presided over the congregation. It erected its first house of, house of worship on Murray Street in 1895. Nine years later, it moved to its second home on King Edward Avenue, and that's the picture that you see here. Apparently, the move to King Edward Avenue was necessary because the Murray Street location was next to a food processor whose staple product was pork and beans. <laughs> During Sabbath services, worshippers were treated to the smell of cooking pork, a most unsatisfactory situation. In 1902, approximately 25 members of Adath Jeshurun organized their own Agudat Achim congregation. It wasn't until 1956 that the two synagogues merged to become Beth Shalom. Moses acquired the city's first Torah from New York. 
Apparently, he sat up all night on the train to make sure that nothing would happen to it. Mervyn says it was Reverend Mursky who did this. I don't know. Anyway, we'll say my understanding it was Moses. When he arrived back in Ottawa, he deposited it in the shul where it belonged. There was no shachet or ritual slaughterer here, so Moses went to Montreal, found a shachet, and had him teach him how to kill chickens so there could be kosher chickens in Ottawa. There's another story here that Mr. Friedman told Rabbi Lifshitz. Apparently, not everyone felt that Moses was to be relied upon to do the slaughtering. Mr. Friedman, anxious to find a better market to distribute butter and eggs, went to Montreal, where he met a Mr. Finkelstein, who, upon learning that there was no shochet in Ottawa, told him that his son-in-law, Jacobson, was just the man for you. Jacobson came to Ottawa and stayed with Moses. By the way, Jacobson stayed three or four years when, because of scandalous behaviors in matters of cost food or keeping kosher, was obliged to leave the city. <laughs> to, to maintain the shochet, each person in a minion pledged 50 cents a month and one penny per pound of meat. Mr. Friedman says, and I quote, Bilski became dissatisfied with the way things were developing and decided on a little program of non-cooperation by complaining that because he had a large family and was buying meat every day, he couldn't afford to pay the 50 cents a month pledge and the one cent per pound meat tax, but would contribute to either one or the other. Mr. Friedman doesn't indicate how this was resolved. <laughs> Moses also organized a Hever Kadisha, or burial society, for Ottawa and the surrounding communities. There was no Jewish cemetery in Ottawa. Interments were made in Montreal. So Moses received the bodies and accompanied the remains to Montreal. On one occasion, a coffin addressed to him arrived unexpectedly at his home. In 1892, the small Ottawa Jewish community decided it needed a clergyman to perform the duties of rabbi, cantor, shochet, and mole. A mole performed circumcisions. The congregation sent Moses to New York. Moses' sister-in-law, a Brooklynite, had met the desired type of cleric. He was a Russian-born rabbinical student named Jacob Mursky. Reverend Mursky served the congregation for 50 years. Moses was also one of the leaders of the Zionist movement in the city. He was confident that in time there would be no more loyal or prosperous country enjoying the protection of the British flag than Palestine. He organized a Zionist society in, uh, in Ottawa in 1899, which by the next year had a membership of 50. In truth, both Moses and Pauline were instrumental in laying the foundation of Jewish life in Ottawa. Pauline was the honorary president of the Ladies' Auxiliary of Adath Jeshrin. She was also the honorary president of the Ottawa Ladies' Hebrew Benevolent Society, which was the first Jewish charitable organization in Ottawa. And I may add, it was the only organization doing charitable work in Ottawa that carried on without civic money. She also took an active interest in Hadassah, and one of the original Hadassah chapters was named in her honor. I'd like to just end with some stories and tributes to Moses. Yeah, Moses. It has been said that Moses was not an unusual type of man, that it was the conditions and the pressing needs of his surroundings that made him unusual. Moses drew upon his forebears' <coughs> ethics in due time, he became an example of, the, of generosity and moral fortitude to Jews and non-Jews, the ideal, practical man in a pioneering age, always ready to relieve the sufferings of the newcomer and, in general, indispensable to a new community. He was, in the main, an old-fashioned Jew. Not for a day in his long and, at first, hard life did he fail to observe the dietary laws and other Jewish rituals. He was unschooled in Jewish law, yet he was a pious man. In the last week of his life, he walked to all three synagogues in the city and said goodbye to his friends. He probably went to the fire station too, since these were his friends also. He participated in the social life of the general community, 
maintaining membership in the Masonic Lodge in Kempville and the Foresters in Montreal. He was the first Jewish Mason and Odd Fellow in Ottawa and was a member of the Ancient Order of United Workmen. He was known throughout Canada as a man of sterling worth and honesty in his business transactions. Loyalty was one of his outstanding traits. He was always positive, he was fun-loving, he was a good storyteller, he was very neat. Moses set, I know, <laughs> Moses set high standards of conduct for his fellow immigrants. On one occasion, he was dismayed to learn that a Jew was being held in the Nicholas Street Jail at the onset of the High Holidays. Moses marched in to see his old friend, the governor, and demanded that the prisoner be released until the religious period was over. The governor acceded to this unusual request. When Moses returned his charge a few days later, he told the governor, you can have the son of a bitch. No Jew should be in jail in the first place, and certainly not during the High Holy Days. <laughs> On principle, Moses would not lend money to any poor man, Jew or Gentile. In the case of a Jew who did not belong to the minion or conduct himself properly, Moses would lend no money at all. One Jewish peddler did not, in Moses' view, live up to the standard of the community. For these reasons, Moses had refused on several occasions to grant him a loan. There was between them a sort of feud. Reverend Mirsky tells the following story. One wintry night, I had been long in bed when the clock struck 12. Outside, one of the fierce blizzards typical of the Ottawa Valley was raging. There were no lights in the streets. Suddenly, I heard a violent rap on my door. I wondered who it might be at that time of night and in such stormy weather. I decided to ignore the knocking of the passerby no matter who he was but the rapping became more insistent and louder. At last I rose, and as I opened the door leading to the street, I saw a gaunt white figure, literally a snow ghost. It was a tall man, with cane in hand, whose face, hat, and body were thickly covered with snow, and from whose eyebrows icicles were hanging. It was Bilski. Dress quickly, he commanded. It's an urgent cause. There was something we had to attend together, he said. I came out and stood near Bilski in the blinding storm. Soon I noticed a small hand sleigh with a considerable cargo, heavily covered with snow. Bilski took hold of a string, tied to the sleigh, and pulling it behind him, walked by my side. With the snow beating his face, he told me that he had just learned that the family of the rascal to whom he had refused a loan was in want. He would not cross the threshold of his house, but he wanted me to bring the little cargo to the needy folks. We plodded knee deep in the snow for an endless half hour. We at last reached a house to which he pointed as the home of the poor family. I cleared the snow off the sleigh and took Bilski's offering inside while he stubbornly waited outside. There were dozens of fruits, loaves of bread, vegetables, bottles of milk, and quantities of butter, cheese, and eggs. All I was instructed to say was, it is yours. It was sent to you. I wonder whether the starving people ever knew who had offered them those life-saving gifts. Such were the ways of Moses, and he didn't care to speak of them. They were a daily thing with him. He helped those who needed help. There was little, little or no difference between Jew, Frenchman, or Englishman. Nobody, he would say, must go hungry in this new land. If one does, he must be fed or punished. The high regard in which Moses was held was demonstrated by the events surrounding his death in 1923 at the age of 94. Despite the extreme cold, his funeral was attended by thousands of all faiths, including the mayor and several members of the city council, provincial legislature, and parliament. After the King Edward Avenue synagogue was filled, hundreds stood in the street. This was the first time that a funeral was held in a synagogue, a rarity in Jewish practice. The second time was the funeral of Moses' daughter, Lillian Freeman. 
The cortege to the cemetery comprised 150 cars and hundreds on foot, one of the largest private funerals ever seen in Ottawa. Moses Bilski was larger than life during his lifetime, and to us, he has been larger than life in our lifetime. We thank our Father for keeping Moses alive for us. Uh, I'll take questions from the floor. Anybody that wants to ask a question, please rise or put up your hand. No questions? Well, I just want to make a comment. My grandfather was a very strong man. I don't mean physically, I mean mentally. And Moses Bilski had to be have the same stubbornness. <laughs> so I guess they clashed a few times. But it's very interesting. The minion that my grandfather attended in 1891 when he arrived in the city was at John Dover's room at 74 Nelson. Mr. Michelson was in attendance at Jacob Cohn. Moses Bilski came from Ottawa, around Pat, Pesach. These are notes that uh, were alluded to, or that were given to uh, Rabbi Lifshitz. And uh, Mrs. Wilson, a Gentile, 70 years old, who uh, owned the home, also attended the Minions because she wanted to know more about Jewish people. The prominent people, or the wealthy people in the city at that time, was the Marx family and the Rosenthal's. Of course, the Rosenthal's were also jewelers, and they were the forerunner of Burke's. Any questions? Any other comments? Okay, uh, Lionel Metric, you're on. Wherever you are. It's, uh, oh boy, is there ever a lot of people? You know, you, you forgot to say, Dr. Lionel Metric, you're retired. Yes, well, I, I, I may, I, but I may be retired from uh, dentistry, but I pose as a physician. I, I do bypasses, forward passes, and ordinary passes. Uh, Anna and Millie, I thoroughly enjoyed your polished resurrection of Moses Belsky. But before I thank you formally, I would like to tell you about a confrontation I had with your great uncle Sam Belsky. That was Moses' second son. In 1921, my mother, Annie Metric, took me to Bilski's jewelry store, right beside the old Union Station on Rideau Street. She bought a present for someone. I was about four years old, and I was beautiful. <laughs> and I haven't changed. Thank you. All of a sudden, without any warning, Sam Bilski hoisted me in the air and sat me down on the glass showcase. I was terrified, and I told him off. <laughs> Years later, my mother told me what I said to him. I said, you have a big nose. My mother was pleased with my, price, uh, my precise assessment. <laughs> While on the subject of confrontations, I also had one with your maternal grandfather, Cantor Rabin. Many years ago, 
I was a choir boy in the King Street Shul Choir, hoping for a career on the stage, just like Al Jolson. And Cantor Raven fired me. I was reluctant to go. He pleaded. He says, Schmolay, you don't have an ear for music. When you sing Ain Kalahenu, it sounds like on the road to Mandalay. We wept and we parted. Anna and Millie, because of your academic and professional backgrounds, we expected and did receive a splendid biography of Moses Belsky. His travels across Canada and the United States, his service in the American Civil War, together with his raw association with the miners in British Columbia, apparently developed in him a mature approach to life and living. He obviously concluded that adherence to the tenets of Judaism was the path to quality citizenship. He prospered, as you said, in his jewelry store. He donated generously to all needy causes. He was just as popular with non-Jewish citizens as he was with Jewish ones. He gave leadership to cheder and synagogue pursuits, particularly to Zionism. In short, he started our community off on the right foot. He, he was a role model for his son-in-law, A.J. Freeman, and his wife, Lillian Bilski, who together provided his brand of leadership for our community for many years after he died. You can, finally, you can justifiably boast about your great-grandfather. My great-grandfather was a pleasant fellow, but he didn't hold a candle to yours. <laughs> In appreciation, please accept these gifts from the Ottawa Jewish Historical Club. Tall girls are my weakness. <laughs> and you know what this tall girl said? Old men are mine. I could state we could have Dr. Uh, Metric back to talk again, but he's talked already once several years ago, and he was as lightning then as he was this evening. That concludes this evening's meeting. I want to thank you for attending. There are displays at the back of the hall on the left side, his family mementos of the Bilski family on the right-hand side, that's my right hand, are mm -hmm. mementos from the Ottawa uh, Jewish Archives. There are refreshments at the end of the evening. Please spend time, take a look, speak to the girls, etc. Many thanks. Welcome back. See you in June. Bye bye. Thank you. Oh, no, no, no. He, 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 a, no, 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 no. That's what uh, history is all about. No, no, I'm not offended. I wouldn't have, I, I would have, I would, I wouldn't have given it to you. Okay? Was it? Oh, sorry. Yeah, just for watching us. Thank you. Bye. Bye.